But joining us right now by Zoom is Elise Bennett, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Welcome to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Elise. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad you could come on today. This is a very important topic that I think our listeners are really interested in. So first, why don't we begin by having you just tell us, remind our listeners about your group, the Center for Biological Diversity. Sure. At the Center for Biological Diversity, our mission is to protect diversity on the planet. That's every single species that exists. And the reason that we want to protect that is because they have an inherent right to, to exist and because we're all connected. And so the way that we do that is by protecting the lands and waters and the climate that we all need to survive. And the, we've been talking a little bit about the Department of the Interior's five-year plan. So what is that plan? Uh, I imagine you know, it's, it's some, somewhat self-explanatory that this is their, their plan for the future. What do we know about that plan and when will it be finalized? Yes, so what we know is that this is essentially a plan for the next five years of oil and gas leasing. And it's proposed to have 10 oil and gas leases in the Gulf from 2023 to, through 2028. And we find that extremely concerning because we know that we're in a climate emergency right now and that every new lease is contributing to more greenhouse gases that are only making this crisis worse. And so, uh, you know, we are, urging Interior that it needs to issue a new plan that has no new leases. Um, the climate emergency, the extinction crisis, and our coastal communities here demand nothing less. And, you know, beyond just not issuing new leases under this five-year plan, we also need to see a phase-out of oil and gas leasing if we're really going to meet our goals to protect our planet from global climate change. You mentioned the 10 potential leases in this plan, but it's it's a draft plan right now. So um, are, is there a possibility that it might change between now and when it's finalized? Well, that's certainly our hope. And that's why we have submitted comments along with many partners asking that there are no new leases. And I would note that even though that comment period is closed, the decision hasn't been made yet. And so for those who are listening, who really care about this and, and wanna make a difference, there's still time to call and write Department of Interior and urge them to adopt a five-year program that doesn't have new leases. I want to remind people that our guest is Elise Bennett, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity based in St. Petersburg. And this is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And you can email your thoughts about this as well to dj at wmnf.org. You can also text 813-433-0885. We've, in Florida, traditionally the state has been against having oil exploration right near the shore of Florida, off the Atlantic coast, off the uh, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. What, is there a possibility that any of these leases could be near Florida? I think we're always concerned about new leases near the state, but I think we also need to look broader and recognize that even leases in the western part of the Gulf are a threat to our livelihood here in the state. We saw with the Deepwater Horizon impacts not just in the Panhandle, that was the closest area to the disaster, but across the western coast, huge impacts to our tourism and our fishing industries. And that's because of the horrible toxic waste that comes from these, these disasters, these leaks, these spills. And so I, I think, um, well, certainly we wanna protect our own front doorstep. Floridians are also concerned about any new drilling in the Gulf. And I think that's why many support not just the phase out, excuse me, not just the, um, the not having new leases, but also phasing out the existing drilling here in the Gulf. What kinds of statements has the Biden administration made when it comes to global and domestic climate commitments and drilling? I think what we're most concerned about is that we're just not seeing enough action fast enough. What we've been calling for is the Biden administration to declare a climate emergency and really take the, the crucial steps that are necessary to reduce greenhouse gas emissions quickly uh, and justly and that's not only to protect biodiversity, which is our focus, but also to protect so many frontline communities that are impacted every day 
by hurricanes of greater intensity, by storm surge, by droughts, by flooding. There it really is no more time to wait. We need to take action now. And we've been really disappointed to see that we haven't seen that swift action. Yeah, it's only about eight years or maybe fewer now than to, to the year 2030. And the I think the Biden administration wants to cut carbon emissions 50% by 2030. Could that happen with new oil and gas leases? No. And that's why we simply can't have any new ones and also why we've been urging that phase out. I want to remind people that our guest is Elise Bennett, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Uh, I want to read from a little bit of a press conference that that group that we heard from earlier, the Protect All Our Coasts Coalition wrote, and I want to get your response to that. They wrote that a new analysis found that stopping new offshore drilling, along with other ocean-based solutions, could help meet a commitment to by delivering nearly 40% of the global emissions reductions needed to keep the planet from warming to catastrophic levels. So we've already talked about stopping new offshore drilling. Do you have an idea of what kind of other ocean-based solutions might help the U.S. get to its climate goals? Well, first, I, I would emphasize, along with that statement, that the Department of Interior's own analysis shows that even just a single Gulf lease could result in up to roughly 46.8 million additional tons of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's the equivalent of 11 coal plants operating for a year. So I, I think that's exactly right, that you know, we can't have these new leases and we have to phase them out because of the huge contribution they make to our climate crisis. Um, you know, beyond that, I think we need to be concerned about the impacts to our species here in, in, the, in the Gulf. And, and one of the species that we're particularly concerned about here is the rice's whale. It's one of the most endangered animals on Earth, and there's only about 50 of them remaining. And their very existence is threatened by oil spills, noise pollution, and vessel traffic that comes along with offshore drilling. And that's why over 100 scientists have recently called on the Biden administration to prohibit this oil and gas leasing, leasing seismic air gun blasting, and other oil activities in that habitat. So avoiding really sensitive areas for species is also a really important part of the puzzle. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. My guest is Elise Bennett, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. We're talking about the Department of Interior's new five-year plan and right now it includes some new oil and gas leasing offshore and the, uh, the CBD, the Center for Biological Diversity, is part of a coalition that's trying to get the Biden administration, the Department of the Interior, to remove those new oil and gas leases from their five-year plan. And a lot of this has to do with climate change. So I know that people that like us that think about this all the time know the connection, but why don't you paint the picture for if you're, if someone is concerned about climate change, or maybe if they're not, why should they be? What do we know about climate change? And especially, what do we know about how climate change is connected to oil and gas drilling? Well, we know that oil and gas drilling contributes to the greenhouse gases that drive our climate emergency. And so, uh, you know, it starts at the very beginning. It's the root cause of the issue. And we know that as our climate warms, there are many effects that it has on our, our communities, including storms of increasing intensity, like most recently Hurricane Ida. Uh, it, it results in higher storm surge as sea levels rise. It results in devastating droughts uh, and flooding, in, in, just incredible flooding among other impacts. And so there's the concern that we're continuing to contribute to a climate that is simply not survivable for us, particularly here in Florida. But beyond that, it's sort of a self-sustaining loop of damage. As we have these increasingly stronger storms from climate change, it also means increased risk of spills and other accidents like the Taylor spill that's been leaking since Katrina and may now be larger than the Deepwater Horizon in terms of its impacts and its leak. And we also had thousands of pollution uh, events that followed Ida. And so uh, the impacts of this drilling are really multifaceted, both in the ways that they contribute to climate change and how climate change and this disaster has essentially created even more devastation in terms of oil spills. 
Our guest is Elise Bennett, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. We have a call from Sarasota, so I think I'm going to take a call, if that's okay with you. Uh, we, let's go now to Gary in Sarasota. Sarasota. Hi, Gary. Hi, good morning. Great show. I agree with everything that she's saying, but I'd like to ask a question that perhaps she would she would have the knowledge of. You know, when it comes to pollution, we're a consumer-based market in the United States, and China is the largest producer of uh, exhaust and, you know, manufacturing exhaust. What's the chance that the Biden administration could pass a, could pass laws where if you're going to sell to us, you have to have our same EPA rules and regulations, or at least something similar to it, instead of them polluting the air and the water over in Asia and Mexico? I mean, Mexico, right across the border. We buy products right across the border from American manufacturers that pollute the Rio Grande and pollute the air, and it comes straight over the United States. And there's there's no consequence. Gary, good question. So, Elise, what about a, sh a shared responsibilities here? How how can that be enforced? Sure. I think although we always want to be holding our global partners accountable, we have to recognize that a huge part of the blame or the responsibility for global climate change rests with us. The United States has been contributing to this pollution for decades and decades. And so we really need to start at home and take a personal responsibility as a country for reducing the, the pollution that we have created that have contributed to the global climate emergency. All right. Thank you for that call, Gary. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the answer, Elise. So um, the group that, that I was playing a, a press conference from earlier, Protect All Our Coast Coalition, they had that nearly, they said that nearly 800,000 comments and petitions in support of no new leases were delivered to the administration during the public comment period on the Department of the Interior's five-year plan for offshore drilling. And President Biden can use executive action to reduce admissions and advance environmental justice by ending new offshore drilling. Now, we've seen some uh, executive actions by the Biden administration be challenged by other entities. So um, is, do you think that that would work if, if the Biden administration took executive action, for example, in this five-year plan? Would that be enough or is there is more needed? Does Congress need to get involved to, uh, to stop new oil and gas leases? We do believe that President Biden has the authority and the obligation to protect us from climate change by, by declaring a climate emergency and by setting new rules that would result in this managed decline of drilling by 2035, which I know was mentioned in a previous clip. And, and that's why we're calling for it, because we truly believe he has that power. Now, would we like to see support from all of our lawmakers to address the problem of climate change? Absolutely. But, but no questions asked. We believe that President Biden has the authority and should be taking these steps to address the climate emergency. We have a call coming in from Clearwater. Let's hear what Terry has to say. Hi, Terry. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. One thing that I haven't heard uh, anybody mention yet, uh, Jimmy Carter back in 77, I think it was, set up a biodiesel program that for $26 million, now that's in 1978 dollars, uh, would have been able to provide enough diesel for the entire country. And the first thing Ronald Reagan did when he got into office was put the kibosh on that plan. And I think that there's simple alternative fuels that we can replace every drop of diesel in this country with biodiesel, that that would be a good start that, you know, these oil companies literally run our country. You know, everything I've ever read, it goes from British dollars to U.S. oil companies. And that's pretty well who runs the show. All right. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. that. You figure out a way to where these oil companies can profit by the biodiesel industry. That would be the way to go, in my opinion. All right. A vote for biodiesel there from Terry. And another recollection from the Carter to... Reagan administration changes that Reagan took the solar panels off the White House. So, uh, Elise, what would you say about alternatives like biodiesel? Well, our dependence on burning fuels is what's contributing to our, our, our global climate emergency. And so we really need to move to renewables that aren't contributing new uh, greenhouse gases 
Because if you burn biodiesel, it's still contributing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Yes. Well, if you'd like to join the conversation, you can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. And let me play another clip that I from the Protect All Our Coast Coalition. This is, let me move to a uh, Florida-based activist. So Mike Sturdivant is with the Surfrider Foundation Emerald Coast in the Florida Panhandle. And here's a short clip of what he had to say at that press conference where people were hoping that the Department of the Interior's five-year plan would include no new oil leases. So here's why Florida uh, I'm a that. licensed mental health counselor. I'm also a K-12 teacher. I'm speaking to you from the classroom just now. The kids are at lunch. And I'm also a volunteer with the Surfrider Foundation. I just want to start by saying that, that offshore drilling should not be expanded in the eastern Gulf of Mexico or the east coast of Florida. Many Gulf Coast residents, including myself, uh, suffered from the effects of the Gulf oil disaster. Uh, I personally had acute skin lesions, I found myself coughing up blood, uh, and we had months and months of direct exposure illnesses. Uh, my child also developed a chronic immune disorder shortly after uh, the disaster. The Coast Guard was never allowed to implement any modern techniques uh, for finding and collecting the oil or for accurately uh, sampling the water and the sand offshore. Uh, and why? Well, because the National Contingency Plan appears to be intentionally outdated. Uh, it utilizes strategies that were developed by the oil industry decades ago and strategies that help the industry basically to shirk their responsibilities when they pollute. Every time I've flown over the existing Gulf oil fields off of uh, my home beaches, I have seen active oil spills every time. And we report them time and again, and, and nothing changes. Uh, the drilling pollution is literally happening every day. And Bowen and the Coast Guard uh, seem to be impotent to do anything meaningful about it. So opening more of our coast to drilling uh, would certainly increase our risk of damage uh, and increase our risk for public illness. And I would just encourage everyone to not sell our children's lives and futures to the short-sighted oil industry and any politicians that support that. And uh, please do not expand offshore drilling. That was Mike Sturdivant with the Surfrider Foundation Emerald Coast in the Florida Panhandle. You're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. This is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. It's 1041 in the morning, and we're talking about the uh, hopes that there are people who hope that the Biden administration will say, say no more new oil and gas leases in the five-year plan by the Department of the Interior. And my guest is Elise Bennett, the Florida director and senior attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. So we can talk more throughout the show about oil and gas drilling, but while I have you, I wanted to talk some more about some of the topics that the Center for Biological Diversity is working on. This morning, our listeners heard about diamondback terrapins. Uh, tomorrow, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission will discuss whether to bring back the captive breeding of diamondback terrapins. That's a type of turtle. It ended in 2006. Populations are in decline due to habitat loss and accidental deaths in blue crab traps. But one of their biggest threats is the global pet market. And although some advocates want to legalize breeding them to prevent wild poaching, 15 biologists signed a letter that asked the FWC not to allow legalized breeding. So what is the Center for Biological Diversity's thoughts about breeding diamondback terrapins as a way to help the species? Right, well, first I'll mention that diamondback terrapins are simply these amazing gems on Florida's coast. And we're so fortunate that we have five of the seven subspecies here. They've got this beautiful speckled skin and a diamond pattern shell, which is what makes them um, a, a very high demand for them in the pet trade. Their beauty is also the folly uh, and a big contributor to their the one of the threats to their existence. And so we have been working for years now to try to protect the terrapin from multiple different threats. And one of those is trafficking and poaching. And so it's been a longstanding rule in Florida that you simply can't possess or do for-profit breeding of diamondback terrapins. And this is in part to protect them from the trade. And this has been a longstanding rule and, and has worked well and made it so that law enforcement is able to identify when terrapins have been poached and taken from the wild. 
there was a recent proposal by some for-profit breeders to allow this new, this entirely new for-profit endeavor to, to breed terrapins. And they presented it as a conservation solution, the idea that you're making more terrapins. And so perhaps that could somehow um, essentially satiate the demand for these turtles. But what we have found over and over again with the commercial breeding of reptiles is that's just not how the markets work. And in fact, when you have commercial breeding and increased commercial breeding, it increases that demand and it also increases the incentive for people to unlawfully go into the wild and take wild terrapins and pass them off as having been captively bred. And so for that reason, uh, these scientists came together and wrote a letter and, and said, this is simply not a conservation solution for the species. And in fact, it could contribute and will likely contribute to increased poaching and trafficking in the state. And there are many other uh, risks associated with that, including genetic pollution, if different uh, subspecies are bred together and then find their way back into the wild, uh, the spread of disease. And so for all those reasons, we're very hopeful that the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission will decide to hold firm and keep the longstanding rules that prohibit this for-profit breeding. Is there a way that people can contact the FWC? Is it taking public comment right now? So the written comment period is closed, but the commission will be meeting in Panama City uh, tomorrow and Thursday. The Terrapin item is coming up tomorrow and there will be an opportunity for oral comments. And speaking of reptiles, uh, you're also, your group is also concerned about gopher tortoises. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has recently decided that it, it will deny Endangered Species Act protections to gopher tortoises. So um, why do you disagree with that decision? Why do you think that gopher tortoises should, be ha should have Endangered Species Act protections? And what might come of this in the future? The best available scientific information we have shows that gopher tortoises are disappearing and they've been in an ongoing decline for decades and decades. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service's own projections show that gopher tortoises will continue to disappear across our landscape in the coming decades. Uh, and additionally, we also have scientific evidence that shows that these, these extirpations of populations are driven by the destruction of habitat largely for urban sprawl and development. And so we feel that the decision by the US Fish and Wildlife Service is just contrary to all of the science that shows us that the gopher tortoise is at great risk and that the major threat, the loss of its habitat is uh, increasing, if anything. We know here in the state that we are constantly seeing new developments, new communities, new strip malls popping up in areas that used to be important upland habitat for gopher tortoises. And the reason we're concerned is not just for the gopher tortoise, although they're incredibly adorable and I love seeing them out in the wild, but also because the gopher tortoises are considered keystone species. They support entire communities of other animals with their burrows that they dig. Uh, there's actually studies now that show that they support more than 360 other species. And so you can really see the health of the gopher tortoise as a direct reflection of the health of our upland forests. And the fact that our gopher tortoises are declining is also a sign that we are losing some of the most important forest ecosystems here in our state. And so that's why we're incredibly concerned about this decision and we're taking a really close look at it now. When these upland forests become destroyed, when the gopher habitat is, um, habitat is the gopher tortoise habitat, when that's paved over, usually to build houses or whatever it is, uh, a lot of times the developers are allowed to relocate these gopher tortoises elsewhere. So that is that a good solution? It doesn't address the root threat to the gopher tortoise, which is the loss of that habitat. And, and actually, unfortunately, it exacerbates it because what you're doing is you're trying to protect all the gopher tortoises, but you're shifting them into smaller and smaller areas of habitat. And eventually we're just going to run out. And so the real concern is that we are just putting off the inevitable, which is forcing this species even closer to extinction. And then beyond that, while we save these individual tortoises, we're also leaving behind whole communities of wildlife that have to find somewhere else to live. And so, um, you know, the damage really goes far beyond just these individual tortoises. And when I spoke to you yesterday, you mentioned that there will likely be developments on gopher tortoise issue in the coming weeks. What do you expect might happen? 
Well, we know that many people oppose this decision. And so we've been taking a really close look at it and, and we're strongly considering challenging the decision because it's just, is so contrary to all of the science that shows us that this species is in danger of extinction. Well, we have a call from William in Tampa. Let's take that call. Hi, William, what's on your mind? Hi, I, I have a cluster of uh, gopher tortoises that live at my property. And I noticed that uh, I have fewer and fewer of them all the time as uh, development increases around me. I have like a little island sort of, of land in an area that is becoming divided up into smaller and smaller plots of land. And uh, all of my neighbors have turned their property into subdivisions, basically, where they, they mow all their grass, they fill in all the gopher holes and stuff. And, and uh, I still have a, a small colony of tortoises uh, that, that are still surviving around uh, my homestead. And uh, I, I, I'm wondering if, if uh, the news that I'm hearing about people being forced to, uh, to uh, uh, approve these elections, that's taking away our freedom of speech and our ability to have honest elections, is that going to affect our, our ability to control the development and, and uh, the diminution of our, our natural wildlife here in Florida? where these elections are being shoved down our throat by these corrupt county officials. All right. Thank you for that question. So um, maybe we can ask, figure that out a way to make that into a gopher tortoise question, Elise. Um, I, if, if there's pockets, I guess, of gopher tortoise habitat that's surrounded by development, is that, is that still a good sign? Is that, is that, uh, is that animal and also that habitat worth protecting? Certainly every scrap of habitat and every gopher tortoise is worth protecting, but exactly what that caller described is something that we're also concerned about, which is called habitat fragmentation. And essentially that means that you're separating off these small little groups of habitat uh, and these tortoises can no longer reach other populations that may have potential mates uh, and a community that they can, they can live with and, and reproduce with. And so what we often do see with these small populations is over time, they get smaller and smaller and, and eventually disappear. Um, and so that's another concern that we definitely see. And, and I would also say this, uh, you know, in response to that caller, democracy is a critical part of protecting our environment. And it's critical that we have a voice and that we use that voice uh, not just to protect our own personal interests and those of our communities, but to also think about our greater wildlife community and what we can be doing better to protect and support them. Our guest is Elise Bennett, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. So far in the show, we've talked about offshore oil and gas drilling. We've talked about diamondback terrapins and gopher tortoises. Whenever um, maybe endangered or threatened Florida species come, comes up, we have to talk about the, the manatee. Um, the, you've, the, the Center for Biological Diversity recently petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to uplist the manatee from threatened to endangered, and that's because of the significant manatee mortalities over the last few years and serious concerns with coastal water quality. So for people who haven't been paying too much attention to this subject, what do we know about how many manatees have died in the last 18 months or so and what might be causing that? So what we know is that we have seen a massive mortality event for manatees over the last year or so, which has resulted in thousands of manatees dying. Uh, many of those deaths have happened in the Indian River Lagoon, which is on the east coast of Florida. And those die-offs are largely attributable to the loss of seagrass, which is driven by water pollution. Uh, highly polluted waters in Indian River Lagoon contributed to these declines in the food that manatees need to survive. And the impact became particularly pronounced in the winter when the manatees come to warm water refuges to, to wait out the cold water until the summer comes back around. So they came to this refuge in the lagoon, but when they got there, the food that they needed to survive wasn't there. And so we had this, this disaster for our manatees. And it's incredibly heartbreaking. And, and I mean, we even had, a, there was a, a, a state and federal led supplemental feeding operation to try our best to just um, react to this incredible disaster that we saw. 
Um, but ultimately what this specific incident that has been ongoing and that we're concerned about this winter, it's showing that our manatees have not recovered to the point where they should be threatened species. They need the full protections of the Endangered Species Act and should be listed as endangered. In fact, they had only been downlisted to threatened back in 2017. And at that time, we had opposed that decision saying, uh, among other things, we're very concerned about boat strikes and we're also concerned about poor water, water quality conditions. And manatee advocates across the state specifically pointed to the Indian River Lagoon and concerns there. So in a lot of ways, what we're seeing over this past year or so is the realization of our very worst fears. And we think the very best thing that the US Fish and Wildlife Service can do is reinstate the full protections of the Endangered Species Act. What's the process for review? Do they have a, an, a regular review time for that? Or is it just a case where is, when they get, you know, when they just get more and more information, then they'll finally review that? What, what might we expect in looking forward to whether the manatee will be considered endangered again? The Endangered Species Act sets forth a, a required uh, timeline for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to respond to our petition. Uh, after we submit that petition, the agency has 90 days to make what we call a 90-day finding. <laughs> but essentially what the agency decides is whether, based on the petition, uh, the, the requested action, in this case an uplisting to endangered, may be warranted. If they decide that it may be warranted, then that kicks off a full status review of the species. And the, the statute requires that within 12 months of our petition, the agency make a decision whether to uplist the species or not. And so we expect and hope that the agency will stick to that required timeline and take really swift action to protect the species given the dire straits that we're seeing them in these last few years. I want to remind people that our guest is Elise Bennett with the, the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. You're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canaan. This is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Uh, so we've talked some about some charismatic megafauna, some some species that people are very familiar with. But let's I'm going to move ask you some questions about some South Florida species that maybe people don't know that much about the Florida bonneted bat and the Miami tiger beetle. First of all, what are these species and why do you think they deserve protections? So the Florida bonneted bat is a federally endangered species. Uh, I think they're incredibly adorable. They're, they're called bonneted bats because they have these large ears that project over the front of their faces like a bonnet. And they're found uh, across South Florida. And interestingly, one of the big threats to the species is sea level rise, which you may not imagine because it's a, it's a species that lives largely in the air and in trees but much of the species habitat is threatened either directly by sea level rise uh, inundating and encroaching upon the habitat and also by um, the effects of climate change as our communities, human communities move inland. There's the concern that we'll be moving into the remaining habitat for this species. So uh, we're incredibly concerned about it. It's critically endangered and uh, it's, it's one of a dozen or so species that are found in a really rare forest in Miami-Dade County called the Miami Pine Rocklands. Um, and along with the bat in the Pine Rocklands lives this beetle called the Miami Tiger Beetle, also an endangered species. They're about the size of a grain of rice. They've got this metallic green candy coated looking um, uh, carapace and they they are incredible hunters. Uh, so they're incredibly tiny, but also fierce. And they live in just some small areas of these pine rocklands in Miami-Dade County as well. And the reason that we're looking at these two species specifically and we're concerned about them is largely because of a projected development in Miami-Dade County, uh, the Miami Wilds Water Park. And at this project has been planned for an area that's an incredibly important foraging area for the Florida bonneted bat. And it's also an area that has proposed critical habitat for the Miami tiger beetle. And critical habitat is a federal designation, which essentially means that the habitat is uh, essential for the survival and recovery of the Miami tiger beetle. So how is it that, a, that this critical habitat might be threatened? I mean, you'd think that from the, the name of it, it's an endangered species, it deserves protection, it has this critical habitat. It sounds like for someone who doesn't know the specifics that it would be off limits to development, but you're saying that it might be threatened by development. 
Right. Well, critical habitat is a designation that becomes important when federal agencies take actions. So anytime a federal agency takes an action, it's not allowed to destroy or what we call adversely modify uh, that habitat. And what's really interesting about this project is it's on land that had land use restrictions set forth by the National Park Service. And um, the National Park Service basically entered an agreement with Miami-Dade County to transfer some of those land use restrictions to allow the leasing and the building of this Miami Wilds project to move forward. But what the agency didn't do was an Endangered Species Act assessment that's required under the act. And that assessment would have required a review of this proposed critical habitat and whether it would be impacted by the project. And so we're, um, I mean, it was shocking to see that National Park Service did not do this endangered species analysis and uh, incredibly disappointing and concerning because of the impact it could have on the Miami tiger beetle who lives on the ground there and the Florida bonneted bat that is constantly flying above feeding. So is there a chance that they'll review that and they'll, they'll reconsider? Well, we've submitted a notice of our intent to sue over that failure, and we have been you know, talking with the agencies and trying to push for the proper environmental review that needs to happen before any of this project moves forward. And, and so that's an ongoing process. Um, we are taking a very close look, and we're working with many partners who are also very concerned about this area and the fate of the Florida bonneted bat, the Miami tiger beetle and many other plants and butterflies that live in the area and are incredibly imperiled. So Elise, before I let you go, why don't you give out the website of the Center for Biological Diversity so people can find out more about these topics if they're interested. If you'd like to learn more about the Center for Biological Diversity, you can go to biologicaldiversity.org and there's all kinds of information about the species that we're protecting, including dozens and dozens that are right here in Florida. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Elise. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you coming on. Elise Bennett is the Florida Director and Senior Attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. And if you missed any of this interview, you can watch it on our website this afternoon. That's WMNF.org. I want to thank our phone screener, Greg Bowers. You've been listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. It's Giving Tuesday. If you like the programming on 88.5 FM, please consider making a donation at WMNF.org. Shelly will host Midpoint in this time slot tomorrow. Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guest is architect, urban designer, and town planner Josh Frank to talk about highway removal and livable cities. That's coming up after NPR headlines. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. <laughs>